Welcome back to Science versus Conspiracy over coffee. I am your co-host, Bob, and science is on assignment this week. So brew some coffee, pull up a chair, and open your mind. This week on Science versus Conspiracy over coffee, I was a guest on policy and rights, talking about 15-minute cities and digital currency over coffee. Let's have a listen to the show. We'll be right back. I gather everybody today to talk about um, 15 minute cities in junction with uh, the digital loony and social implications to that. So um, let's, I'm going to welcome both, both LB and Bob Homer to the show. Uh, Bob Homer, as you know, um, he is the host of Conspiracy and Science. And Bob, uh, starting with you, you mm -hmm. uh, actually did a um, you did an episode on Fifteen Minute City, right? We did uh, earlier this year. We talked about the well, I, I'm the the science or I'm the conspiracy part of the the, the discussion, and uh, Jennifer is the science. So I talked about all the um the possible negative implications of it and jen talked about um po possibly some pos um, positives um but i think where we ended up was that there's a lot of um there, there's a lot of concern <laughs> around um making something like this uh, a reality because yeah. on, on paper it looks good, but otherwise, um, when you really get dive into it, um, there's some serious issues surrounding it. Yeah. Okay. So, so um, introducing uh, LB, you're um, you, of course you're you're my resident uh, temperament to to my human rights activist stuff, and you're a huge advocate for human rights, um, especially with different things with corporations and stuff like that so trying to keep our society on track with these things and equality right so what and you were the, actually the one who emailed me the information about 15 minute cities and how it is being approved across canada right uh yeah i had come across some information um that suggested that in several cities it was being um, approved in some cities more publicly um, where citizens had the opportunity to chime in and offer their opinion and in other cities where it was simply um, being announced that it was in the works without a lot of public um, conversation. Yeah. So from a human rights perspective, you know, just forcing something like that, what are some of the some of the positives and some of the negatives that for human rights with the 50 minutes. Well, <laughs> as it's already been alluded, it's quite a complex, um, it's quite a complex topic. And I think the, the biggest thing is that there's not really the ability to have really good conversations about where this could all lead without um, the governments and the municipalities actually coming out with solid plans and really letting us know what's going to be happening. Right. So there's a lot of speculation. There's a lot of conjecture. There's a lot of like, where is this thing going to lead? Where is that going to go? And so if you look at where it can lead and where it could go and what it could be used for, I think there's a lot of reasons to be concerned. Um, but how it's being presented, I would say at this moment, without a lot of detail, as this very sort of you know, climate friendly, um, easeful thing like a European village, you know, I mean, who doesn't love that? You know, my family comes from Europe. I've spent a lot of time there. I mean, it's wonderful, right? To have everything central and be able to walk to it. There's, it sounds really nice um, in how it's being packaged, but we're not really getting the details. We're not really being told how far it will go. We're not being told where it will stop, what our boundaries will be, what will happen to people that aren't affected positively by it. Um, and I think that's probably the most concerning part of this is that there is a real lack of detailed plans being um, released to the public. So we really don't know. 
Okay, so uh, along with that, uh, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this throw this out there that there are now a, uh, I received another email from someone in Alberta about the introduction of the digital loony, where we all know about blockchains and Bitcoin, where it's decentralized, and which allows freedom of opinion and freedom of of um, of, of usage of it without because it's decentralized and it's not attached to a central bank or a corporation or government um but in this particular case there the digital loony or digital currencies being issued by a government it will be through a centralized bank and what happens when we put those two things together and it's already in this one uh global news report they were already talking about how China's experimenting with it and how they're getting great positive results. <laughs> I was like, so um, both of you are, are aware of how China does their social media and the downside to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what do we think? I think it's a slippery slope to introduce um, a non-decentralized uh, currency um, because with, with cryptocurrency, like you said, it is decentralized um, and it's it's anonymous. What they're proposing is that they're going to, that the government will have access and control over what you spend your money on and how you spend your money. And I think that's a slippery slope of where that could lead to. Mm -hmm. It's definitely being suggested that um, it could be used as a control measure to um, make sure that you don't purchase too much of a certain thing or purchase things that are not good for the environment, things like this. And again, it's like, who's making those decisions? Where mm -hmm. does it stop? Um, where do rights come into play versus what is potentially being done without a lot of discussion? Yeah. Well, my opinion on this is, is where does democracy actually come into if the government's handing it over to us? What happened to democracy? What are we supposed to decide as as a as a group and vote on things? So in theory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would say in, in theory more than in reality these days there seems to be a lot of legislation and decisions being made without a lot of public input um which is concerning yeah, yeah. i mean it's been it's been happening for a while i mean i mean we can i mean we can be pretty straight up about this i mean not everyone's mm -hmm. noticed it happening for a while i have because i have a background that was uh somewhat tied into the medical industry and the school systems and I saw legislation slowly being put through that was really strange. It was strange. There wasn't a lot of intention behind it. It was being put through without a lot of public conversation. And then it mm -hmm. actually wasn't being used right off the bat. And it was like, well, what's, what is this being put in for? Yeah. You know, and then you start progressively moving forward and you start seeing them tie things into this legislation that was just kind of quietly put under. And then mm -hmm. you start seeing how they have been shaping future policies quite far in advance um and you start to see the slippery slope mm -hmm. you start to see where it's like what aren't they telling us and what do we need to have in terms of conversations mm -hmm. and you know and when is government maybe getting a little bit too much power and control yeah uh, you know, for, for me, the, the first time I noticed that something was going wrong was the cable industry. When television was going from being that you need the rabbit ears to pick up the news to this whole subscription base, you got to you, you have to call uh, Shaw or or tell us and, and have them plug a cable into your house in order for you to get television. And when it went up for a vote, in some areas, because it didn't always go up for a vote in all areas, but it went up for a vote in some areas that there was misinformation attached to the vote 
that a vote yes was actually was actually the vote no. They twisted the words around so that it confused people. And that was one of the things that I've noticed that um, in a lot of votes, how they're setting things up, they're, they're introducing confusion and misinformation to control things also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely all within the message and how they word things because um, a, a specific phrase could sway somebody one way or the other when they don't fully understand what what they're voting on or or for yeah exactly mm -hmm. right so and well the, the the example i'm bringing up was probably before the year 2000 and and we're up to 2023 and now all of a sudden we're looking at they're trying to introduce a uh a, cent a centralized currency and oh well we had Tip McKenzie talking about how it's positive because oh with COVID imagine that we would have been able to as a government been able to beef up your bank account but at the same time if they can beef up our bank account at the same time can't they take the money back out again because we said something they didn't like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. yep yeah. They've also put legislation through that they can pull money out of our bank accounts if our systems start failing. Those were put through a few years ago, um, very quietly as well. There, there's, there's a lot of implications there, and just hackability, things like that, um, security. Um, those are also implications. Because yeah, um, how many times have we heard about data breaches with health records and? You apply that same sort of sense of security to our, our financial system and um it, it's really unsafe yeah i don't i got a survey from the bank of canada asking about the currency and they did ask about the security and you know my response was it's just a matter of time until somebody figures out how to hack it i mean and particularly with ai things like this mm -hmm. like we're advancing very quickly from a technological standpoint and mm -hmm. You know, it's just really a matter of time until something's hackable, not really, you know, I and mean, there's nothing more to it than that. Like someone's going to mm -hmm. figure it out. And then what do we do if we're all tied into that? Exactly. Right, right. Uh, it, let, let's face it, um, it um, the, the federal government especially does not have a very good track record with um, cybersecurity. Mm-hmm. And especially with the uh, Arrive app or Arrive Can or whatever that app was for yeah. uh, for travel that they introduced, it was supposed to be like a six billion or million dollar project or something like that, and then it escalated to like hundreds of millions of dollars um, for really no reason. Um, and so they had no idea what they're doing. So how are they? How can we trust them to know what they're doing um, with our money? Well, it's, it's true. And then we find out that they were, you know, also selling our information. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hmm. But don't worry when they do a currency, they won't do that. No, no, of course we don't not. need, we don't need to worry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like having a really like bad, you know, uh, you know, friend or lover or business partner, and they keep doing wrong by you. You're like, mm -hmm. ah, they won't do it again. They'll do it differently this time, right? Yeah. <laughs> they figured it out now. Uh huh. <laughs> well, uh, on that on that issue, like, what 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 is what transparency and ethics? I mean, do 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 our political figures have transparency or ethics? <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, don't worry, we 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 will never lie to you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> time and time and time again. Um, yeah. Yep. It's kind of like that ongoing abusive long term relationship. They've changed as you know, I mean, there are people in politics that do have ethics. I do think so. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, you can see them really not being able to do their jobs well. And you can see them at this point, uh, where we are in our, our current climate, you can actually see them being berated. You can see like, like, uh, looking at Parliament right now, a lot of the time to me just looks like a school yard, 
you know, situation where there's like bullying tactics, there's, you know, just mocking people, there's just ignoring people, just, you know, sort of laughing at them versus answering them. Like it's, it's so unprofessional, you know, and there are politicians in that room attempting to bring up important topics and, and attempting to have important conversations. And yet there seems to be a political client climate here in Canada where being professional is just not a thing. Like it's just not required. And I find that also very concerning. Like why mm -hmm. aren't we holding our politicians to a higher standard when it comes to having intelligent conversations, actually answering each other's questions? There's topics that are just being completely avoided as well. And it's quite obvious. Yeah, excuse me. Yeah, yeah, and, and it, it, it goes beyond uh, party stripes too. Um, everybody's uh, been um, accused of it and been a part of it. So it's not just one party versus another or one province or federally, provincially, um, even local city councils um, suffer from the same thing. They have these um, these agendas and um, yeah. it's not all, always apparent of what it is right, right then and there. But as time goes on, you get to see the bigger picture. Well, yeah, I, I'm actually living in a city that's dead center of that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, policing. Uh, well, oh no, you don't get a chance to, to to say how you feel about having. Should we have the RCMP or shouldn't we have the RCMP? Well, it never was asked of the public. We were just told, oh, we're getting rid of the RCMP. You know. So again, where where happened to democracy? You know. Yeah, and, and sometimes it's not necessarily that it's a bad idea. Um, it's just that we're not informed and we're not told about it. It's just it's kind of pushed down our throats, and and that particular agenda is moved along, and it, it's been being manipulated. Um, yeah, it's true. I mean, there's been things that have gone on in my local city council. Um, where even when I've tried to bring it up and ask if there's going to be a conversation on it, is there going to be, you know, a time where, you know, we could, you know, can we send a letter? Can we speak up? Can we voice some concerns? Is there going to be a conversation on this? Um, it's interesting because I've ended up seeing, um, where they've actually pulled it right out of this city's purview and they've actually started putting it into other parts of government. And, in the case I know of one a topic that I kind of followed, I won't go to the specifics, but it actually got me all the way up to the top of the provincial. Um, like it got me this weird prevent. I got to, I basically forwarded all the way up there. It took months to get there, and then no one would answer me. Like hmm. they were just like, "We're we're not going to talk to you about this." So it went from like the city telling me that it was actually like a city buildings um, off under their authority, and then it just kept getting pawned off and pawned off. And it was interesting because I, I do have a few friends that are reporters and um, there was like, no way, Leanne, like that's not at all. Like that's a city thing. And I'm like, no, it's not, you know? And then they followed the breadcrumbs and and got the freedom of information done on it. And sure enough, it's, it's, it's not, but cities were paying for these things, even though they weren't city decisions, which is interesting. And again, I'm wondering what happened with that because traditionally, um, not many people realize this, but in Canada, our municipalities actually hold a lot of power. Um, they actually have a lot of authority to regulate what goes on within them. And it seems like somewhere along the lines that's kind of gotten distorted, which is again, also kind of an interesting thing to consider. Well, there were there was an issue uh, around a, a hospital in um, in one municipality. It's an older hospital and, it, and it's and it's being closed and being replaced. Um, the replacement of the hospital is being moved from an area where there's um, where it's impoverished and it's being moved to a more upscale neighborhood. And when I asked the mayor about it. He said it's completely out of my hands. He's like, I wish I could keep keep it keep them the um the these medical services where they are and not move them, but it was 
completely yanked out of his hands and then move and and decided on on a provincial level and and, and then hand it back to him. So I mean hmm. and shouldn't the, the municipality have have the ability to say, hey, but this this is the group here. They need services and this group over here is already covered. Shouldn't it, shouldn't the, the the mayor of the city or the or the city council be able to determine that? You would think so, but, but again, it goes back to the the overarching agendas that um, people with more power are kind of imposing on uh, the municipalities and everybody underneath them. Yeah. Somebody yeah. Um, said to me today about uh, and I. Um, I don't know how far off topic this actually goes, but uh, somebody said said to me today that that there's a, a shadow government that has a corporate agenda. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> how far? How much do you want me to get into that today? <laughs> <laughs> well, go ahead, go for it, Bob. <laughs> Oh, he's preparing us as he has his. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. Here comes the warm up. <laughs> no, no it, it probably this the shadow government probably falls out of the, well, partly out of the fifteen minute city and digital currency because it, it does stretch far beyond and it's far more far reaching than, um, uh, than anything. Um. But yeah, there's 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 groups of people who are in government, who are not in government, but are are, are members of um, corporations that definitely have an influence on on policy, not just in Canada, not just in the U.S., but um, worldwide. Um, some people call them um, like. Uh, I don't know how far I want to go in with this, but like, um, because you have like people like um, the Carlisle Group and um, uh, Bilderberg, um, those those types of organizations where these rich and powerful people meet and have um, week long meetings once a year, and probably throughout the year, but they they um, have a very public. Um, display uh once a year and they they talk of supposedly what they talk about is setting the agendas for um what's to come so so what's to come is just determined by a group of, of billionaires so to speak and not by our actual elected officials or even some of the appointed global officials that we see like in the UN, the, the, the WHO or mm -hmm. any of those sort of groups. Those are all kind of underneath these other groups. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff. Um, yeah, I actually grew up around a lot of politics. It's an interesting setup, but uh, and uh, when I was young, I was like, I was going to be a politician because I went through my social studies classes and I saw all this stuff and I was like, wow, like this, this country is built ineffectively. And um, so I went and I, I talked to some of these people in politics and one person was like, please promise me you'll never get into politics. <laughs> and... Um, you know, I was like, well, what do you mean? Like, there's all these, you know, checks and safeties and balances. And they said, no, you have to sell your soul to get as far as they did in politics, which was quite far. Mm -hmm. And, and they're like, things are not what they seem. Things are not always recorded. Conversations happen all over the place. And it's tied into big business huge. And I, ironically, then had a career at another point in my like a little bit later, like because I was just a kid back then, but I had a career later where I did work with some very, very, very large international corporations. And I started to see what this person was talking about. 
it was just very interesting seeing the connection between government policies, what companies wanted, what they didn't want seen, um, where there was maybe stir ups in uh, with other governments, um, like potential wars, things like that occurring. Um, yeah, you start to see how like tied in everything is. And I'm sure I had like the teeniest little viewpoint of that mm -hmm. um, versus what, like, there's no way that was the whole thing, right? And so it's like, if what I saw was as invasive as it was, um, there's definitely more there for people to be concerned about, like to be asking real questions about, um, because that means that, you know, democracy is not really what it says it is. Um, you know, how often are we just simply being sold um, ideas versus legitimately agreeing with what's going on and actually knowing what one thing is going to lead to or the next. So, okay, we, we've talked about a lot about the, the bad news part. What, what is it that, the, the, in you guys' opinion, what is it that we can actually do to push back? <laughs> what can we do to push back? We all have to ask questions and not accept what, what we're told <laughs> and keep asking those questions and not just questions, asking those tough questions. Um, like even down to, um, I'll give this quick example. Um, a few well maybe seven or eight years ago um i went to las vegas for a photography convention and um going across the um through the tsa security and i was questioning why i had to take off my belt and my shoes and just by asking saying um why why do we have to do it this way i was surrounded in moments by other TSA agents and escorted to a secondary room to be um, added down and everything. And just by asking questions like that, it stirs up. Um, you're, you're questioning someone's authority and they don't like that. Um, all the way down to the, the TSA agents and all the way up the, 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 the chain uh, to who's ever on top. But so by asking, asking these questions and not blindly obeying, I think that's one of the ways that we, we're going to have to like push back and not in a, like a confrontational way. I wasn't being confrontational because um, that won't get us anywhere. And that just gets negative publicity and um, we get demonized and whatever. Um, but by being calm, rational and asking, just asking questions. Um, uh, of our um, politicians, right, and making businesses accountable too, um, like through like social media or um, big business. Um, what are their practices? What are what are you, what are they doing to to make it their their business better? Right. I I like that asking questions. Um, you you're reminding me of of course the scientific method. Right. <laughs> you keep asking questions because into into till one day we, we might actually find the ultimate answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because there's been so many occasions that when we're told one thing and then years later it it's come out um through freedom of inf information or um whistleblowers or whatever that the the official story that we got was completely mm. false. Um but nobody was asking questions. They were just told that this was the way and um, and went with it. But just because it's that way doesn't mean that's the, the correct way or the right way or how it should be done. Right. Yeah, that's a really good lead into just to like, you know, in terms of how we have conversations and how we participate in society, there is a really large culture um, of there's a, a culture that's arising um, among people that says like we can't question things anymore 
right? And that's <laughs> dangerous because we do need to question things. We do need to um, use our brains. We do need to think about things. We do need to be able to make decisions for ourselves and our families um, that that work. And you know, we want to be able to stand by our decisions. And yet there is this growing culture of like, it's not right to ask questions. It's not okay. Like to ask that question is invasive or that's violent or, um, you know, you must be stupid to ask that question. I mean, it's so fascinating because you mean you go back, you know, in time, it's like, oh, there's no stupid question, ask questions. You know, like we used to have Mm -hmm. a culture that encouraged debate, that encouraged questioning, that encouraged having calm, rational conversations from two different viewpoints. And now there's this culture of really shutting down viewpoints that are different than your own or shutting down questions you can't answer or shutting down conversations that um, are maybe uncomfortable. And that does not breed good relationships, good policies. It doesn't breed good relationships like a one to one or on a larger scale, like with our governments. It just creates this sort of um vulnerability to this is what we're all going to do and we're just all going to go with it no one's going to question it no one's going to discuss it and then the problem is is sometimes those ideas are not good mm-hmm. you know sometimes they're terrible we needed to have a dis- uh, you know a discussion on it sometimes there is something else going on but no one's getting to the bottom of it because nobody's asking so like even in your households you know to have to have a culture where questions can be asked where your children, you know, and your other family members can have, um, you know, reasonable debates with each other on different um, topics where we're not pushing our ideas and our beliefs on other people and then expecting them to go with it. If you even just create that in your home, right? Mm -hmm. And that's gonna start to break out past your home and we can actually have these conversations with our neighbors and, and other people and then maybe city council and, maybe you know our schools and maybe our government and things like that because that questioning thing that you are mm-hmm. talking about is so important yet we are systematically building a culture where asking questions has now become an act of violence or to have a conversation with someone that um is 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 contrary to what they believe believe is considered violent and you know i don't know about you guys but when i do history studies, um, when cultures start to go that way, that's usually a fairly bad sign. Like usually nothing good comes after that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that is really important for us all to be doing and not to just blindly going with things and blindly accepting um, narratives and ideas that are not our own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's the whole... Um, you're either with us or against us. Um, so if you don't see, it's, nothing's black and white and they're trying to make it out to be black and white. Um, yes. And like if you it, don't, yeah, if you don't fully believe it, then you, you, you must be against us. Yes, like very nuanced conversations, mm-hmm. you know, are being made very black and white. I'm like, like, hold on. There's like all of these, <laughs> there's all of these other things and facts missing out of this conversation, yep. but you can't bring them up no it's like no that's not what it's about it's like this or this and it's like that's not true and you know if you actually look at societies that go into a like a very totalitarian type state there are um there are key things that happen prior to that and one of them is this formation of extremes where um the society itself and the government and all that starts you know rallying in two different extremes And then because of these extreme views on both sides, which I see in Canada right now, the moderate middle becomes scared of speaking up the moderate middle, which is like 95% of people become scared to ask questions to say anything. And yet if they did, it would lead the whole society in a more moderate path. Yet because there's these two extremes, everyone kind of gets silenced. And then weirdly enough, these two extremes usually end up offering the same solutions at the end of the day like one is not actually better than the other they're both quite rigid and um you know not not the best for the larger population Mm -hmm. right yeah 
Yeah, problem, reaction, solution. They introduce the problem, then the solution. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. They create the reaction and then have the, the solution for their problem that they initially created. Which is on the, the extreme end of, of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. well, we saw that in, in uh, okay, in the pandemic, right? Uh, a lot of a lot of, uh, of the public missed this. And in the end, we're seeing this extreme inflation where our grocery bills are through the roof and to fuel up our cars is like re ultimately ridiculous. But um, what what was missed by the public was at the beginning of the pandemic, when Justin Trudeau decided, oh, I'm going to create the serve, he had to print almost a trillion dollars. So he flooded the flooded our economy, the Canadian economy, with what was close to to a trillion dollars to be able to pay for the distribution of the CERB money. Mm -hmm. Well, what mm -hmm. happens when the government decides to print a whole bunch of money that inflation usually follows a year or two later? Yes, it's economics. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yes. Apparently so, no one has that so, good sense. But don't worry, they can print off some more money now that costs have gone up and they can mm -hmm. give you some basic living income so that they can flood it with more money so that everything can cost even more and you can't afford that either. But don't worry, then they'll have some more money. Right, but then there's the digital <laughs> currency. We'll we'll solve the problem with the digital currency. So don't worry. Yeah, exactly. right? Because we've already been printing money anyways, so we mm -hmm. might as well digitally print it. Like this is like it it's you know, it's interesting. And then it's like, well, you can't afford anything. So then yes, like a 15 minute seem be beautiful because you don't need a car. Mm -hmm. Now you don't have to afford your car. You don't you, you can walk to, go to work. Yeah, exactly. You don't have to go anywhere. Exactly. And it'll be nice to the environment. Um, you know, but then what if you do want to go somewhere? Ah, see that that's where we're where we're leading into uh, well th this particular conversation as it hits social media and uh, the the Chinese model is as this conversation would hit social media that all three of our bank accounts would be locked up. Go where? <laughs> right? More more than just your bank account. Literally, you would not be able to go get a train ticket. Um, like they can fully lock you up. Um, like they can restrict you from just about um, all of your services um, simply because you've been a bad citizen, yeah. um, according to what has been determined to be good or bad, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's dangerous in my opinion. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I, I grew up and I learned how to be a functional, responsible adult and I don't need the government doing my parenting for me and I don't need them doing it for my children either or my grandchildren. And that's, you know, that's not why, you know, my ancestors that came, you know, fled from, you know, communist countries um, to give my family a life here. That's not why they came. You know, they didn't come here to have more of that. Well, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get into the topic of, of ancestors because my ancestors are indigenous. Oh, wait, colonialism, <laughs> there's another topic. We're going to leave that topic alone for right now. Though. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, mine came more recently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, like there, there's lots of implications with this, right? Like if we, if you do have 15 minute cities and we do have a digital currency, and, you know, those two things are tied into each other. You know, how quickly could you potentially not be able to access your 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 money if you screwed up? Um, we do already know that a lot of the groundwork for watching us on social media has already been laid. That's, you know, that's factual. There's no conspiracy about that. It's there. It's built into um, the social media platforms. They could probably already give us a rating. Um, you know, so it's it's not like, you know, it, the conversations around 15 minutes, there's not actually a lot of conspiracy talk, I would say, even really going on. There's mm -hmm. a lot of actual factual things happening all over the world with it um, that could very easily affect the freedoms that we have and the rights that we have and our ability to move and our ability to have a business. 
and even trying to have conversations with local governments about that i'm involved with businesses and we are attempting to have conversations with municipalities about how we would you know if these cities are put in how does that affect us as businesses how do we move from city to city doing our job having our employees move from city to city would they be penalized would we have the same amount of passes would we have more passes you know are they not going to restrict movement at all in which case you know that's kind of interesting it's not generally where these conversations are leading right now but you know if that's factually not going to happen then we'd like to know that too but like mm-hmm. how is that going to affect people's businesses how is it going to affect where they work like if you have to work within 15 minutes of you where you live and you don't work remotely does that mean you need to get a new job and then what if it's not the same money who who handles the extra money for you is that where this basic income conversation is coming in then will you be told that you can just work any job within 15 minutes and you can make basic income like there's so many pieces to this that aren't being discussed Mm -hmm. there's a good question is is basic income going to pay for us to maintain um the the type of uh, of of middle class life that we actually have right now or is it going to or is there going to be a downgrade well where's the money going to come from to pay everybody that basic income are they going to print more money which is going to skyrocket everything and the, the, the cycle continues yeah exactly and then and then what happens then do we end up like countries where then your choices are now limited because that's all you know people can afford we don't really have a market for these other things now we don't have businesses that are bringing in new and innovative products because Mm. they've also been restricted by whatever policies are in place and costs and all of that you know i I know a lot of business owners a lot of business owners that i know have left canada Mm -hmm. they're not here anymore they're like you know where the the decisions that are being made here do not seem beneficial for their businesses i I don't blame them Mm -hmm. And and that that's another good point. And uh, when I did the the episode on on my show, we talked about this in a fair bit. Was if you have the fifteen minute cities, what kind of the what types of businesses are going to be allowed to to come in? Like, are they going to be they're going to be the Costco's and the big box stores, and the little mom and pop shops aren't are, are going to be pushed out because mm-hmm. one, they're not going to be able to afford the rent. They're not going to have the um, the foot traffic. The um so there's 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 just going to be big box stores and are there are each zone is there going to be like a costco in every zone or like how's uh or like for restaurants or are, are they going to be like fast food mcdonald's or um or what happens they have um like a, a subway in our in one zone but then you want to go to like an italian restaurant two zones over how how is that going to work when they when they're setting uh limits like in um oxford england when you can only go 100 free trips yep. um or or they're going to start fining you 70 pounds per extra trip like how's i don't understand how that's going to be beneficial yeah and then do the rich people get to like move around more than the poor people mm-hmm. you know like how about that um, you know, how rural people, how are they going to do that? I mean, look, some rural communities need to like come into cities for their medical care for like all of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, how are, how are those businesses in rural cities going to get their supplies? How are they going to be doing business? Are we just going to be squeezing out rural cities, like rural, rural towns, Mm -hmm. rural people? Um, you know, and then how does that work into our class system? Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, because they can't have a hospital in every little zone. Every fifteen minutes, a, a, a hospital that has state-of-the-art equipment and doctors, um, it, it's just not possible. Um, exactly. So, yeah, so you're going to have to call an ambulance to take you three zones over. That's going to cost you. So you're not going to people on lower income. They're not going to mm-hmm. be able to afford to do that. So like you said it's going to create like a whole separate class and it's going to divide us even even further yeah i know like what if you have like you know a family member that's in the hospital or you know needs to be somewhere else for medical attention or something like that like a child 
you know, are mm -hmm. they going to give you an apartment in that zone? And then if we start going there, then that just opens up a whole nother can of worms. Where are we going to give you, give people apartments from if we need to start doing that so that they can live in a zone temporarily? Um, mm -hmm. Where's that coming from? Who's going to own that? You know, what is the system that's going to be behind that? It seems like to really implement 15 minute cities, you would need to implement a lot of other city, like systems and policies and structures that aren't currently in place. And I'm just really unsure why these aren't being discussed. I mean, these seem like things mm -hmm. that we'd really have to think through before implementation. And yet cities are already implementing this stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you're bringing up uh, some, some interesting points on, on housing though. And the, the term affordable housing um, is very vague. And if we if we look closely in from when we were growing up to our children, the possibility of home ownership is has shrunk. It has shrunk tremendously. That um, it, it they're with the whole fifteen minute city thing. Are they going to push out the idea of home ownership and that somebody somebody else owns the land and you're just renting? And I think even the types of homes that they're building are they're, they're pushing a certain type of home because what we're going to be in the market in a, but another year, year and a half. Um, but anything that's in our price range is going to be a, a small condo, three bedrooms. <laughs> um, when we don't want a small condo and three bedrooms, we want something slightly bigger, but they're not making they're not making like those types of houses um that like where we are now um anymore because they're trying to stack as many people and create and, and I'm seeing more and more of the um resident or um retail below residential above mm -hmm. um they're all so they're not they may not be uh doing a 15 minute city but they are they're they're trying to they're they're already starting to create it create it with um, forcing developers to put retail underneath and smaller three bed junior three bedroom condos up above um, with tiny ba uh, balconies yeah. and, and no yard and making it more a communal um, living space yeah down below and not everybody wants that but that's all that the new developments that that's being built through the vast majority of new development that's it's being built yeah. I mean, that's, it's not even actually healthy living for some people, some people, and we know mm -hmm. this are very sensitive to Wi Fi routers, things like that. And um, if you're that kind of person, and you're living in an like densely compacted apartment building, um, there are actual health problems that you're going to have living that close to that many routers that you know, many signals um, that are just on all day. Mm -hmm. um so it's not even actually reasonable living conditions for some people even if you could do it and you did like it um you know from every other standpoint right so again there's another nuanced conversation we aren't all built the same we're not all built to live the same we're not all built to be eating the same things and you know it is a little concerning when you start looking at 15 minute cities that there would be some sort of way that we would all need to be living in order to adapt to that and would that actually be reasonable to be asking everyone to do yeah right and that, that that's a good point because they're trying to make this cookie cutter solution that's going to work everywhere regardless of of climate of geography uh population um this 15 minute c this this is the way um but it, it's not there, there's so like we've talked about there's so many nuances and gray areas in in the conversation that it's not going to work the way that it's going to it's not going to work the same in in every single area around the world um it has to be adapted to to the region to the to the area to the population that's there um, and 
um, find solutions for those individual areas, not just some cookie cutter. It works here, so it, it's it's got to work over in Australia. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then if you don't fit, do you get spef- special privileges? And then mm-hmm. how do we determine special privileges? Um, you know, who's who's doing that? Who gets to leave for special privileged reasons or? you know, you mm-hmm. bring in different foods for special privileged reasons. I mean, I find it fascinating that we're talking about 15 minute cities for like climate change, but we still fly our food halfway over the planet, <laughs> you know, food that could be grown here if we actually supported better agricultural practices and actually gave people, you know, the ability to go run farms um, in a really smart way, mm-hmm. farms that have mixed um you know, that are mixed, they're not just, you know, cattle, they're not just vegetables, they're not just, you know, because there's a lot of implications with that. Really farming needs to be mixed. We need to be doing all these different things on the same land so that it can be revitalized and renourished and actually be used smartly. Um, but we're not doing that. Like that, th- this system kind of systematically pushes those options away too. So are we gonna start flying in we're going to be like saving ourselves with like carbon climate change stuff in our 15 minute city but we're going to be flying more stuff in or i don't know it's weird and then i heard where did i hear the other day it was some newscasters talking about like starting to fill an application to fly places too because like that's bad as well Mm. um and then would we need to start asking for permission to go on vacations and business trips and we would be like applying and you know this they made this sound very exciting um because you know you get to apply to right. travel yeah. and I don't, I don't know it, it didn't sound super exciting to me i'm like who decides then yeah. if your trip to go see your dying relative is okay or your trip for business is okay and if we are doing 15 minute cities then will trips for business be okay at all outside of even our drivable zones <laughs> mm-hmm. um you know like how far does this reach out and how far does it restrict us and then again do some people get special privileges like if you guys are really good speakers will you get like a special card that lets you travel around and speak or yeah 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 well you you you, you see see this whole application to travel thing you bring up a good point when you talk about the mass media person standing in front of a camera or sitting in front of a camera, as it were. Yeah, um, they were sitting. It, it, uh, <laughs> and the, it's like, how exciting is this that you get to apply for? It's like, but they're 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 building up a, a, uh, a wall of propaganda that people were like, oh, see, the, you made it sound exciting. And they're... It, Okay, I, I, I'm going to drop the first f bomb in in this whole conversation. It's a mind fuck. <laughs> well, well, just look at the the Nexus cards. The conditioning for this type of applying to travel, um, the Nexus card makes you travel between Canada and the U.S. Um, super fast. You don't have to wait in line. Um, you just have to apply for it and go through security checks and 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 pay a fee for mm-hmm. this extra privilege. So for for years uh, since the introduction of it, it's 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 just another way of conditioning us slowly mm-hmm. over time, introducing bit by bit. Um, like this whole thing reminds me of like a a pointillism painting. When you're looking at it really up close, it's just a bunch of little random dots, and you can't see it but then when you step back you see the whole picture and that's kind of like what they're doing here with us is that they're giving us these they're making us stand two inches away from the painting and here's a dot here's a dot here's a dot it's all good um because these are nice these are nice colors and whatever um but they don't want you to step back and and see the big picture yeah they don't want to see what you're doing what what they're doing yeah On on the step back part and, and um, there's a legislation in um, in Ottawa that it, they wrapped around that uh, idea of social media that in this bill was actually created during COVID because the there was people out there saying, well, questioning what it was that we were doing during during the COVID um, 
pandemic. And now that we're past it, then of course, past the pandemic. Um, but this bill would actually make it more or less make it illegal for you to say anything outside of what the mass media is 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 talking about. That if you make a post, that it can be yanked down, and maybe you can be fined. However, they determined the, with digital currency. However, they determined that that fine would look like. Maybe you lose social media points or something. But um, this bill is sitting there and just waiting for the right vote to happen so that it can be passed through. And no, and people are thinking that it's aim solely at those people who want to cause controversy, but the controversy is really what the bill actually says and how it can affect anyone and take take your ability to speak up away from it. Yeah, I mean, people often agree with these things when they agree with whatever the government is saying at the moment or the media. Mm -hmm. But I mean, as soon as you flip it around, and uh, they believe something that you know goes against that. You know, it it tends to change, and we've seen this in in previous civilizations and previous societies, right? It's all fine and dandy when you feel like you're on the right side of it to be penalizing other people for speaking up and having different opinions, but you know, when it turns and it becomes your turn to be mm -hmm. quieted or to be told to do something that you don't agree with or to have your family subjected to something that you don't believe in, mm -hmm. then it, you know, then it's like, oh, well, yikes, <laughs> but it's too late. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, right. Uh, so, you know. Yeah. Anyway, because um, we, 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 can, we can keep going with this, but we're, we're, we do have a time limit. So um, <laughs> why don't we get to final thoughts and LB, Final thoughts on on um, on fifteen minute cities and combined with uh, with digital currency separately or combined. I think there needs to be a lot more public open discussion about it. There's a lot more questions that need to be asked. There's a lot of answers that need to be provided. We would need to set really appropriate limits and boundaries um, as things are being rolled out now. I think it's a completely slippery slope. Um, I don't think you know, people should be supporting just a haphazard sort of rollout. Um, why would we do that? I mean, that's just, that's not, that's not a good way to run your life. It's not a good way to run a business. It's not a good way to run a country or a city, right? Um, people should really be looking for in-depth, well thought out answers on both of these things and really be looking into as many aspects of these um, issues as they can, because, you know, as we've just like touched on just a teeny weeny little bit today, there's so many parts of our society and our family life and our personal lives that these things would, would or could touch on and affect and change. So, you know, I think that, um, you know, these are topics that we really need to proceed with, with a lot of caution in terms of agreeing with because there's just there's so much that's just not really being fully discussed at this point in a in a public way where we would know where things would lead and where they would stop and what the boundaries would be and how we would deal with all of these nuances that would arise from these two things okay go ahead bob i totally agree <laughs> um we, I, I think our, our our leaders, whoops, our leaders should have should make decisions based on on science and economics and public input, and not just have like a knee jerk reaction to um, whatever the hot topic is of the day, and create a policy that um, that's not well thought out and poor and ultimately poorly implemented and then um yeah yeah the hot science of the day like all the science mm -hmm. all the science <laughs> not just what's trendy right now or what one study showed or whatever it is on yeah. any number of um topics there 
Yes. All right. Okay. So, thanks, guys. <laughs> um, thanks. And, and thank, thank you, everybody, for listening. And these are some really hot, hot topic items. And uh, we need to actually investigate as uh, the general public and and enforce our government officials to keep us in a real democracy where we can actually speak up. So I want to thank everybody again for listening. Uh, please find that subscribe button wherever it may be on your computer screen or your phone. And uh, keep listening to uh, policy and rights as we come up with more updates about what is happening with government policy versus human rights. Thanks, guys. It's been nice talking to you again. Thanks, LB, and thanks, Bob. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please hit the subscribe button wherever it is on your screen. And we hope to see you back here next week. And remember, being paranoid is smart. We'll see you next time. This week's episode of Science vs. Conspiracy Over Coffee was co-produced by Story Monkey Productions and Depictions Media.